Hi, I'm Bob Kerridge, animal welfareist. Chloe Phillips Harris is horse mad, has been since a child. At the age of 25, in addition to running her own riding schools, her passion also takes her around the world in her own time and with her own funds, working for a charity dedicated to educating people in the welfare of horses and donkeys. This is Chloe's incredible story. A galloping horse, I just love it. It's just an adrenaline rush and just, I think that feeling of power, it's very different from, you know, driving a car fast. It's that raw, live power, I guess. It just feels fantastic. It doesn't matter if you're galloping down the beach, galloping across country, galloping across from Mongolia. It's a good feeling. I'm really lucky to live in the beautiful Bay of Islands in the winterless north and um, have a farm here that me and mum run and have the horses. I was born in Texas but moved here with my mother when I was 10 months old, luckily for me, so I have lots of horses. It's pretty much me and mum on the farm. My father lives in Opawa and he's a bit of an adventurer as well. He built a sailing ship, like an old pirate ship type thing, and sailed around the world, and that's how my parents met. And I think I, think I was definitely lucky to um, have both two adventurous parents, which probably helped inspire me in some of the things I've done. I just knew she needed a farm, because we had seven acres, but that wasn't big enough for the number of horses that we were acquiring. You know, you have to act quickly with children because their childhood goes so fast. You can't wait till it's right for you. You have to do it when it's right for them. I got my first horse when I was six and a half. She was just a terror. You'd go out for a ride and you'd get to the top of the hill and she'd turn and just bolt down at full speed. And I just remember hanging on for dear life and having no control. And she wasn't a fun first pony. It was more, <laughs> you learned to stay on her back and that was about it. By some fluke of luck, I went on my very terrible pony at the time and actually won my first competition. I loved it. It felt so good and um, I kind of liked being like on naughty horses. It was just made it a little bit more exciting. She was incredible on in her stickability too because I had no ability to buy a nice horse. Even though I tried my best, I would always buy a horse that was ran away or bucked or did something crazy. And the fact that she stuck with it was just amazing. Right, uh, let's go out and have some fun with old Billy. My mum, in desperation, um, took me to a horse trainer called Ken Drongo. And Ken's gone on to be my mentor throughout my riding career. And it's probably the reason that I'm still riding, because he gave me such a good, good base in understanding horses and how they work and how they think and how they react and how to deal with them and train with them. So I wanted to work a little bit um, on cantilades. I've just got one horse at home that's just being difficult. and. I don't know, I feel like I'm trying everything with them. OK, And um, well, it's not we'll, really happening for me. Um, we'll go through a few things with this. This horse, he picks up both leads pretty good, so you can just hop on him and get the feel of him. Yeah. Um, so Chloe yeah, clicked onto it pretty quick, so, you know, the, the world was her oyster, and she's done so many different things since, since way back then. Say walk. Walk. She told me I was her mentor. It's kind of like, wow, well, I think it might have changed roles there somewhere. It's like I look at what Chloe's doing and I'm going, wow, that's a good idea. Yeah, see, he's not happy on this lead, is nah, he? Nah, not at all. <coughs> what am I doing here? It's really just a matter of really getting him smooth yeah. on, in the trot on this side. Yeah. So when you're wanting him to, to straighten up and canter to the left, he's kind of wanting to stay like this. Yeah. You know, because you, you're re it's really a conversation. You yep. know, you're having a conversation with the horse, trying to keep him in the right mindset. Good. Excellent. I think I didn't just want to work with Steady horses. I didn't just want to be a good rider. That's all I wanted right. to make sure I had a really good. wide knowledge base, that and I knew the horsemanship, that I knew the training, yeah. that I knew the sport Most horse side of things. Like, I just really, really, really wanted to learn. So when I left school, I went and worked for a man called Bill Noble, who is one of the best dressage trainers in New Zealand. And at the time, that was my weakest point. After that, I actually went to Germany and did my riding exams over there, just because I did want to see a whole other side of the horse world as well. And I learned heaps there, which was really good for me. After Germany, 
I basically came home and um, decided that I kind of wanted to give it a go on my own and just started training and selling horses as well as teaching lessons and running riding camps for kids and competing myself and from there um, ended up working with the Kaimanawa horses. I always really wanted to see if I could train a wild horse, like could I take something that had never been handled by humans and turn it into a you know, show horse or a riding horse or a competition horse. I think it's actually a lot quicker than people think to domesticate them, if you do it right. For me, I've got my way of doing it. It's really, really quick and it's no stress to the horse. So usually they arrive on the stock track, you know, I leave them to settle in for a day and then the next day you might um, separate one off and just start working with it, getting it comfortable being around you and then putting the halter on it. And once you've got the halter on, Within minutes, you can actually teach them to move off pressure and understand that, you know, if you're pulling on the lead rope, it means look this way and then take a step this way. Chloe does this incredible, gentle, uh, natural horsemanship. With perfect timing, slip a rope around them, and it was just this magical experience where they weren't hurt, they weren't frightened. And like she says herself, they've never had a bad experience with a human, so they're open-minded to what you're going to do. And as long as you don't then show them we're bad in some way, then they actually can become very trusting and, and listen to what you're trying to say. Probably out of all my kind men, was the star of the show is Fern. And she came from the 2010 muster. We broke her in and she's just gone on to be a fantastic competition horse. Absolutely no one thinks she's a Kaimanawa. She surprises everyone. But as far as competition, you know, she's great at that, but she's also great. You can put any kid on her. You can put my mum on her. We take her to the beach and use her for wakeboarding. And she's just such a lovely all-round horse. It's not always the glamorous work of, you know, taming wild horses or doing competitive riding. A lot of it's just basic handling or feeding out hay or fixing fences or putting covers on. It is really, really rewarding when it goes right. With the riding camps, I used to go on camps as a kid, and I just love it. It's just the best memories of school holidays of being on camps with all my friends and riding your pony every day and jumping every day and, you know, being away from your parents and eating lollies and all that kind of stuff. Right, who is going to get eggs for me? Are you still going to get them? Yeah. Yes. About three years ago, I started running them just because um, I think when I did the camps, you know, someone helped me, gave me really a good knowledge base. I think you do have to um, pay that knowledge forward in a way and teach the next generation what you know. All right, guys, how are we all going? Ready to make a proper start? We're going to lead them. We're going to lead them way out in front. And that way, hopefully, if we stop, they're going to stop and not just bowl us straight to the... Ground. So see this kind of stuff? He's kind of not listening. Like, it's not too dangerous, but one day we want him to do something, he just won't move. Good boy. So we'll all have a little go. And if you're leading them along and you stop, and they don't stop, you're just going to bump them a little bit with the rope and have them just back up to a nice, safe distance, OK? For me, it's really important that um, no the kids are safe with their ponies. So the first thing I do with every riding camp is make sure that just basic stuff, like they can lead their horses safely, oh. that um, you know their horse isn't going to run over top of them as they're leading. So teaching the kids you know, to be a safe distance from their horse and teaching the ponies that they need to be a safe distance away from um, the kids that are leading them. All right, so do we all think we've got a bit of control and we can get on our horses going to be OK? Sinking your heels down. You know, some of the kids I've been teaching for a few years now, and it's so cool to see how much they've progressed in their achievements. And I do, I get lots of satisfaction out of, you know, teaching them all I know and hopefully helping them to go on and have a career with horses. Heels down, eyes up. Looking up, Hamish. Yeah, better. When you watch the Olympics or something like that and you see Mark Todd or Jonathan Padgett going leaping over these massive obstacles into the water, it all starts here, so with young horses and young kids, just getting them comfortable walking through the water, then trotting through the water. It's all really good foundations for um, going up levels and progressing. We think, oh, the rain! Ask him to go. 
Good girl. And sit back. Good girl. There's a lot of patience involved. And I think teaching is actually really difficult. I've, I'm getting better at it, but you know, to begin with, it's Good really girl. hard to say things in a way that kids back. will understand. But yeah, I really love it, and it is, it is really difficult, but it's rewarding at the same time. Good girl. Eyes up. Good girl. Give him a pat. That's so cool for a young horse. And we both got our horses from Chloe, so she knows our horses pretty well as well and can help out. She builds my confidence so much. Like, she'll just say, do this, and then you'll do it, and then you'll be like, oh, that's so fun. Yeah. And um, she's just so kind to the horses, and she knows the horses. She can, like, read them like a book. Good. Give him a little rub. Just let him look now for a second, because he goes, oh, it's a bit scary. The water's OK, Fluffy. I've been teaching him how to go through water, and I've been doing that by um, letting <laughs> someone else go first and then fo Fluffy following. Good, give him a big rub on the neck. Fluffy's so brave. A horse reacts to things around them. It doesn't really plan ahead how it's going to react. You know, if something scares it, it runs or it bolts or it turns or it bucks. It doesn't plan the day tomorrow and think, oh, I might buck with this rider at this point. You know, it's only ever reacting to what's happening directly around it. And I think girl, it's really important that horses are treated like horses Eyes and not up. like a dog. Brilliant. And keep going straight for a bit longer. Looking straight. Chloe's just really good luck. It was actually her who got me riding in the first place with one of her horses at the Pie Hair Pony Club. And after that, I was just hooked and, yeah, it was just real good fun. <laughs> Fantastic. It's, it's good that camp's over. I love doing them and I really enjoy teaching the kids, but always by the end you're really tired. It's nice to just have a little break and sit down and not have a hundred questions being fired at you. It kind of never stops. I think just running the whole business myself, there's always emails to answer and always after camp there's parents' emails to ask, you know, they're already booking in for the next camp or they've got questions or something. I was just looking for something different to do. Just looking for something that was a bit more um, meaningful, I guess. And I just happened to be on Facebook one night and um, saw these pictures going up. And I thought, oh, God, these are horrific pictures of horses in Egypt. I'd really like to be able to do something. And the lady um, putting the pictures up I'd never met, but her name was Michelle. And um, I emailed her and said, please, please, please let me come on your trip. I really, really want to do it. Like, I'll do anything, just please take me. And um, luckily she said, yes, come along. And I never met her before I got to the airport, but it turned out to be one of the best things I ever did. I set up Kiwi Care at the end of 2011 um, because I'd seen what was going on in Egypt with all the, the after the political turmoil, there was horses dying in the street, um, and I decided that there was something that needed to be done about it. So I put something up on social media, and Chloe was the very first person to get in touch, to beg to come along, um, wanted to be involved, and from day one she has been outstanding. We take teams of vets and animal experts into developing countries to um, educate the locals on better care of their working animals. We're there to educate, we're there to train people. Um, without having a, a working animal that's going to be fit and healthy, the locals can't make an income. And in these countries, these animals are number one. I don't think I've ever seen such a messed up horse. We have seen a lot of really distressing sights in these countries that we go to, from animals dying in the street um, to animals being worked hard, like in the pyramids areas, being worked extremely hard by tourists um, with broken legs, with damaged tendons, which for a horse is, is a pretty ca catastrophic injury. Um, and Chloe just gets in there, gets the job done without getting emotional about it. It's not often that you can find a, a young person who can do all of the work and do it to a professional level, get the job done and put your emotions aside and deal with that later, which is exactly what everyone on, on the team has to do. I don't mind the blood, the guts, the gore, the horror of working in Egypt or India or Fiji or wherever it is. I truly do just love jumping in and being able to do something. I really feel hands-on. And even working with people on the streets and just seeing, you know, a side of things 
where horses are not high in commodity, they're a way of life and that people, you know, are really struggling to, just, to survive in these areas and really relying on their horses and hopefully if we can help them manage that better or teach them better ways, hopefully, hopefully it'll help improve their life as well. The Mongol Derby I wanted to do for years and years, ever since I first heard about it, it looked absolutely fantastic. It looked like something I, like a thousand kilometres across complete wilderness. To me, it looked amazing. I told lots of people about it and they all told me that it would not be amazing and that it was suicidal, but I just selectively chose not to listen to that. Um, but just the challenge, I just wanted to really see if I could do it. And because I have worked with Kiwi Care Team and I've seen the horrendous stuff, the really, really, truly, awful side of what happens to working horses and poverty and um, the really, really sad side of, of working horses. And I wanted to see a different horse culture where it wasn't poverty driven, where it was um, almost a sense of pride and something that they still relied on for survival, but it wasn't a, a poverty. It was a really a choice and something that was celebrated within the Mongolian culture. So to see that and yeah, just to see if I really could ride a thousand kilometres, you know, could I really walk the walk, not just, you know, talk right before the race, you know, in a couple of hours. It's about a thousand kilometres across Mongolia. This is the last luxury. After this, there's no more meals, no more showers, no more toilets. So much luck is going to come into play. We've already seen it, you know, horse selection, you can't tell with these horses what's going to be good, what's going to be bad. Horses you wouldn't touch at home are race winners here. So much skill, but so much luck in this. I think unless you've done it, you cannot even imagine how hard it really, really is. Like, I ride all day, every day, and it was a huge challenge for me. I loved it. It was definitely the highlight of my life so far. Nothing else has come close to that. It was also probably some of the worst times of my entire life. Even just the wear and tear on your joints, like um, my ankles and knees swelled, and by you know the second and third day, you'd get off your horse and you, you literally just couldn't even walk. You were so sore. There's no fences, there's no roads, there's very few towns. You're not within sight of another human being and you're on a feral Mongolian pony. <laughs> it's good to know that you can survive that kind of stuff. You get a new horse every 40 kilometres and the horses are supplied by the Mongolian families, by nomadic herding families. So it's really the horses they use in their everyday life. I got sick, I think, on day four. All of a sudden I was galloping along, throwing up down the side of my horse, <laughs> which is not very glamorous. I was getting progressively worse. Even a mouthful of water couldn't stay down but I didn't want to get left too, too far behind, so I decided to ride on after half an hour. And by this stage, I'd been riding um, about 80 kilometres, really, really sick and hadn't had any water and just felt really, really delirious. I made it to the next horse station, literally holding onto the front of my saddle to stay on. I, I got there and I couldn't see straight, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. I was just pretty much lying in a miserable heap on the ground. The medics were called and I got IVs that night and by the next morning I was feeling better so I managed to climb on another pony and keep going and it, the next morning it was, it was actually a really good feeling knowing that, that I could keep going and you know that it wasn't going to kill me that I was tough enough. This is my little steed down here, a bit slow this one, he doesn't really like it but it's pretty steep going and I'm feeling a lot better, definitely over my food poisoning and sickness. Being somewhere like this definitely cheers you up. I ended up coming fifth, which I was happy about because none of the four riders in front of me got sick. And the riders that did get sick finished two days behind me. Oh, it's the last day of the Mongol Derby. I got in two days ago. And the final riders are just under a kilometre away. So we're all here to cheer them on for the final, final stretch. <laughs> It was amazing. I loved it. Going through the finished legs was a huge relief, but it felt amazing. I don't think anyone else could have done it in, in the style that she did it. 
And um, I know that from speaking to other people that were there and from seeing their comments on social media that possibly Chloe was one of the most popular people over there, which doesn't surprise me because she's always willing to, to stop and help somebody. She's prepared to give it her all. And even when she's laying off the side of a horse vomiting and just about dead on the side of the horse jumping wild dogs, she just keeps going. And that is... That's Chloe. She's always been an independent spirit, so I, I knew that that would be her future. Um, but the thing is, when, when you have somebody that's very talented, they're very athletic, they're very strong, you know they're going to be safe, as safe as possible doing what they're doing, whether it be in Mongolia or in Africa or in India. Bad things can happen anywhere. Uh, so I think that if you come to terms with mortality and realize it exists everywhere, you just then get on with the living part. I love the farm and I love coming home. I think I'd like to be a bit closer at times to the hub of the equestrian world because every Friday in the competition season, you know, it's a very long drive on your own to get to competitions. There's always more adventures on the horizon. With my big horse, Jet, I'd like to see how far we can go. I'd like to know that I gave it everything I got and, you know, reach his potential and my potential. Everyone says they want to go to the Olympics and that would be fantastic. I'd like to compete at the highest level in New Zealand and if I can do that and feel like I did a good job of it, I'll be really happy with that. <laughs>